God is an invisible God. But he is an invisible God who longs to be more visible to us. And one of the clearest examples of what God looks like and who God is, we find that in the life of Jesus. In, in the way he lived, in, in the way he spoke, uh, in, in the way he, he behaved. We can learn a lot about who God is. And we can learn what this kingdom is that he talks about. This kingdom of God that he longs to establish on earth and in our individual hearts, in our world. But see, Jesus promises his disciples something. He promises them more than just a, a new reality. That this, this kingdom that he wants to establish here on earth. I'm going to this over. This kingdom that he longs to establish on earth and in our hearts and in, in the hearts of the disciples. It's more than just a new reality. It's, it's, it's active, it's alive, it's powerful. And, and he, he, he spurs on his disciples. He wants to help them understand. Then look, disciples, and I think he says the same thing to us. I'm looking for more than just you being a part of this. I'm looking for more than, than you just being uh, just, just another ingredient. See, you're more than just the flower. You're more than just the water, the salt, whatever else. I need you to be the active, participatory agent to help spur this on. See, my kingdom, God says, my kingdom is coming and, and everyone's going to just they're going to experience it in one way or another. But there are some people who I'm calling to be an active, moving catalyst to help bring this kingdom about. They are not to be bystanders who simply wait around to witness this new kingdom. But they're to be the catalyst actively bringing his kingdom into reality. And I believe this is who he calls us to be as well. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? I'm in Luke chapter 6. And we'll be reading from verses 27 through 36. And now I'm going to warn you before we read this. I, I typically kind of have one passage and I stick with it. Today, we're going to go a little bit back and forth between this passage and, and, and what I read at the very beginning. About the yeast and the bread. But Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. <coughs> but to you who are listening, I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? <laughs> Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. Because He is kind. 
to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I want to go through this just briefly because there's four things that happen here that Jesus says, look, these things need to happen. All right, there's, there's four things here that, that this needs to happen. And this needs to happen not just in response to the people that you care about, get along with, and, and hang out with all the time and have some commonality with. This needs to happen with your enemies. See, we think, we think that our world is, is, is bad. Like, we tend to have this perspective of, boy, things are just really going downhill. Things are not, things are not good. And, boy, I wish I could go back to Jesus' time. Because everything, I mean, he was just, it, Jesus was there. And I'd just hang out with him because everything was going to be fine. But, but we see in these passages, we learn that, no. No, see, these people must have had enemies. There, there must have been people out there going, Nah, this whole Jesus thing, this is, you Christians, you know, nah. there, there was conflict. Conflict isn't new. Family conflict isn't new. Societal conflict isn't new. It's not, it's, it's not just something that we deal with today. This has been something, when you have broken human beings, broken, selfish human beings, Conflict is going to happen. It's not just something we deal with today. And so Jesus says, let me, let me help you understand how you might act in a way that might be a catalyst for bringing about my Father's kingdom here on earth. In the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of this conflict, can, can, I, can I share with you, this is Jesus, can I share with you some, some ways that you might be able to act and respond and love in a way that, that might show other people what my kingdom is like. And here's what he says. Starting in verse 27. See, Jesus calls us to a higher standard of dealing with our enemies. He calls us to go the, the extra mile. And he does it in, in these four ways. First, in verse 27, he says, love them. Love them. Love your enemies. And, and the, the love here is this agape love that we've talked a lot about. But I think it's okay to be reminded of what agape love is, right? Agape love is, is, is what... And I didn't write this down. That's bad. I, I, an author I was reading this week said, It's a love without reciprocity. Big word, right? Yeah, because I could never would have come up with that on my own, right? So I will credit it to someone who I think it was in the New Beacon Bible Commentary. A, a love without reciprocity. And that, the, that word reciprocity means it, it's not it's it, it, it's not reciprocal. Right? See, reciprocal means I do something, and because I do something, um, uh, there's a there's a response over here that is required. This response is required because I did something, or, or they did something, and, and I'm going to reciprocate that because they did it first. And Jesus, Jesus says that, that this love, this agape love, see, this is, this is a love without reciprocity. It doesn't matter what they do. My love is not determined by what they do. My love is determined by what has already been done for me. See, it's not this, it's not this horizontal relationship. It, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a relationship that may only exist one way. This week I was in downtown Kansas City and I, I there must be a rhyme and a reason to the one-way streets. I know we have a few here. 
But I had this idea, I was trying to get this parking garage, and I'm looking on my maps, I'm like, that's dumb, why would it take me that way? I can just go right over here and pull right into the parking garage. And I get there, and nope, it's a one-way street going this way. Well, I missed my turn I should have taken that was the dumb way. <laughs> and somehow, I, I don't know where I ended up, but I had to slow, I had to stop, not just slow down, I stopped reprogrammed it, and I'm like, okay, fine, I will follow, I will follow what the GPS says, and sure enough, it was because they're one-way streets. The GPS knew better than I did, but it's a one-way street, and, and sometimes our agape love, this love without reciprocity, sometimes it's a one-way street, and we don't like that. That doesn't make sense. Why is everything always going that way, and there's nothing coming back to me? Because that's a godly love. It's not dependent on what comes back my way. We're called to make it all go from here to our heart and out. See, this is more than just avoiding hate. This is more than just avoiding hate for our enemies. It's an active Love. Also in verse 27, Jesus says, Do good to those who hate you. Jesus calls us to a higher standing of dealing with our enemies. He calls us to go the extra mile by doing good to them. Now, this idea of goodness, this is a this, this, the sermon's not on goodness, okay? But see, we, our idea of good it is very different than what Scripture says good is, or goodness is. You know, goodness is a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We think goodness is kind of this lower standard of love, but it's not. It's an, it's an active, it's an active behavior. Where, like love, we're doing something good. When we say God is good, we don't just mean that, oh, yeah, God is pretty good. No, when we say God is good, we mean that, like, God is pure. God is right. God is holy. So this idea of goodness, like love, it's, it's, it's a goodness without reciprocity. It's not an avoidance. Hear this, please. It's not an avoidance of our enemies. It's not a, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay away from them. As if you've done something like above and beyond by just avoiding someone. No, it's an active, I'm going to actively go out and do good to this person. Verse 28 says, Bless those who curse you. If you get cursed, I think there are two socially acceptable responses to getting cursed. Right? The, the, the first one is to reciprocate. Right? Oh no, you're, you're not talking to me that way. You're not talking to me that way. I'm not letting you get away with this. I shall say something back to you that shall make me go, ha. Right? That's socially acceptable. It's socially acceptable because starting when we're really, really young, they did it first. It's socially acceptable by the laws of this land. There is such thing as self-defense. Right? Like they acted in self-defense. Which is, which is okay. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you can't act in self-defense, but idea of who threw the first punch. Well, whoever threw the first punch 
is really the guilty one, right? We want to know who started it. Because whoever started it in our society is more guilty than the person who either finished it or kept it going, right? But see, Jesus says to bless those who curse you. See, the second acceptable response is, I just walked away. And we go, oh, wow. You're so strong. Wow, that your self-control. Oh, wow. Now that is a good thing, right? That is a good thing, okay? Teens, because you're the only ones that need to hear this. It's good to walk away, okay? It's great to walk away. That is, that is a much better response than reciprocating the negativity, okay? Much better. But Jesus says, that's not quite good enough for those who I expect to be the catalyst to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. I expect more from my people. I expect more than just walking away. I expect you to bless that person. Now, I don't want to get into the theology of what a blessing is. But these are positive words. These are prophetic words. When we bless our, our kids, you know, you don't need to put up there, I'm just pointing out there. When we bless our kids with that blessing, we, we are saying we realize this may not be the case right now. What we are saying may not be reality right now, but, but we believe in a God who can accomplish and wants to accomplish in your life the things that we are saying up there. In other words, for our enemies, we believe in a God who can change this situation. We believe in a God without reminding them that they're you know, messed up and got this all wrong. We believe that God may want to do something in your life just like he wants to do something in my life. So not only am I going to just avoid this situation, I, I'm going to speak prophetic, loving words to you. Also in verse 28, he says, pray for those who mistreat you. Notice Jesus says, pray for those, not about those. So this is a very key difference, right? We, we think that praying for our enemies means that we pray that they change, right? Don't we? And it's okay. You can shake your head. I, yes. I, my default is I'm going to pray for that person because, man, they do not get it. And I'm going to pray that they change their ways so that everything between us can be okay because I'm right. I know I'm following God, right? Okay. Pray for them, not about them. Pray for their soul. Pray for, for God's extra grace in their life. Pray for his love, his pure love to fill their heart. Jesus says, don't just pray about them, pray for them. Unfortunately, avoiding all of these things has become the acceptable default for many of us Christians. It's better than revenge, right? That's better, it's more acceptable. But Jesus calls us to more. He raises the standard. And he goes on to say, what credit is it to you? If you love those who love you, 
If you do good to those who do good to you, if you only lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? He says even sinners do that. But he says the reward will be great when we go that extra mile. Your reward will be great, this is verse 35, and you will be children of the Most High. He says, this is how I'm going to identify who the children of God are. The ones who don't just take the socially acceptable response and, and, and take the, oh, good job, you did, oh, that's great. That's, just because it's different than what the world says is acceptable doesn't mean it's the righteous response, right? There's a difference between okay and holy. There's a difference between being, I'm okay with God. I'm okay in God's sight. I'm, I'm good. There's a difference between that and being holy in God's sight. Your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High. I want you to hear this. It's going to be up on the screen. It's a very important truth that we need to hear. Relationships don't thrive because the guilty are punished, but because the innocent are merciful. Let that, I had a professor that used to say, let that marinate, right? Let that, let that settle for just a moment. Relationships don't thrive because the guilty are punished, but because the innocent are merciful. See, Jesus knew that the bringing of the kingdom of God had to be put into the hands and hearts of real people. Yes, he sent his son Jesus to this earth to, to walk this earth and to, to bring about the kingdom of heaven, to bring about the kingdom of God. Was one of his first words was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. But see, he didn't just walk around by himself going, I got this, I got this, I got this. No, he brought real people along with him. Pastor Kyle talked last week about this. The calling of the first disciples. He said, I, I, I need real human people to, to embody this idea of the kingdom of God. And Jesus spent great time. He didn't just preach to his disciples. He, he spends great time teaching just regular, ordinary people what it means to be an active agent, to be a catalyst for the bringing about of the kingdom of God on earth. And this illustration of yeast that I used earlier, it's not, it's not a new one. You know, Jesus uses it to illustrate how the kingdom of God would come about. Again, it's in Luke 13, verses 20 through 21. You can open there if you want, but I'm just going to, I just want to touch on it briefly. See, he says a few things here this kingdom of heaven that he's talking about, this is Jesus' rule over the current age. Okay, God's, God's kingdom here on earth. And in the current age, the, this rule, it, it's spiritual. And it exists within the hearts of believers. That's in Luke 17, 21. See, God wants to rule your heart. He wants us in our free will, to place him on the throne of our hearts. But the parable of the yeast shows that the kingdom of God, first of all, begins with regular, ordinary people. Notice, did, oh, did I have it up there? Let's read it again. Again, he asks, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. 
this kingdom of heaven, it begins with regular, ordinary people. He uses this term woman. And remember he used this term. He, he addressed his own mother as woman. Okay? And, and, it, and remember, it wasn't derogatory. It was his way of saying, hey, you're human, and, and I want you to understand, Mom, that, that I'm divine. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, I, I just want you to remember, Mother, that, that, that you're human. And, and so he uses this, this term, begins with regular ordinary people, he uses this term woman. He could have said a, a, a baker, right? Sixty pounds. Oh, that's a lot of flour, right? That's a whole lot of flour, 60 pounds. But your typical woman isn't going to just have 60 pounds of flour sitting around. Now, if you've got a, a baker who, who does this, that, that, that might be something that, that they would do. But he says woman because he wants them to understand this is a normal woman who's doing something with an abnormal amount of ingredients. But she has the capability to do something that we would assume that now a professional would have to do that. Bringing on to the kingdom of God begins with regular, ordinary people. It has small beginnings, but it will increase. See, yeast, yeast, it's teeny tiny. Even the little things that you, that you throw into, into the dough, that's, that's, there, there's billions of little yeast in there. And what happens is, is they, they get into one little spot in that dough. And the, the reason the dough rises, like I said earlier, is, is they begin to eat on the ingredients in there. And then it expands and, and it works its way through the entire dough. kingdom of God has small beginnings, but it will increase. The kingdom of God exerts its influence from within, not from without. The kingdom of God begins in us. It begins in our individual hearts. It begins because we take a simple step of obedience, and it begins to work out into our relationships. And then other people's hearts begin to catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God, and it grows and it expands. And because of that, it will have a comprehensive effect. And though working invisibly, it will have an effect that is evident to all. I was trying to figure out a way to illustrate this tangibly, and I've been having a conversation with someone in this family of faith, and she sent me something again this week, and I went, yes, that's it, that, that's it, that, that's, that's what I'm preaching about. On Sunday night, so I said, Missy, can I, can I use this? Can, can I use your story? Because, because I, I think it illustrates how God working in the heart of one person can begin to work out into their relationships. And I think it illustrates how, how sometimes we have to take a step back and go, wait a second. I've been trying to fix these relationships on my own. Maybe I'll just see what God wants to do. So, Missy, I see you in the back. Will you just stand up? I know you don't want any credit for this, but that's Missy Boysen back there. And over the course of many weeks, she began sharing just little snippets of ways that God 
was healing her family. My name's in here a few times. Okay, and so I'm kind of weird about that. It feels kind of weird to have my name in here, but I, and I know Missy would say the same thing. Don't hear our names. Hear what God is doing, okay? I've been a Christian for 20 years, and God continues to amaze me. We can't physically see God, but occasionally we get to experience the power of God. And that experience is absolutely unforgettable. In November, Pastor Robbie spoke on 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 18. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong. Sounds a lot like our passage today, right? But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Missy says, I left church that day reflecting on the sermon. I thought about the broken relationships in my own family, and there was so much regret and bitterness, but I had no idea how to fix it. I wasn't even sure it was fixable. It all began to crumble almost immediately after my father passed away seven years ago. And then six months later, my mother passed away. I can't tell you what happened, how it started, or why, but all five children experienced a meltdown and we parted ways. Two siblings on one side and three on the other. How sad, I thought, for my mother to know that the family had fallen apart. Such a disappointment, an utter failure of sorts. Well, two things are quite clear for the Christian. God values, first, our relationship with him, and second, our relationship with others. The first four commandments refer to our relationship with God, and the remaining six commandments refer to our relationship with others, and there's no getting around it. That's definitely God's top ten list. As I drove home from church that day, I was grateful that reconciliation with my twin was currently underway. But my heart and head were saying, now you need to mend that broken relationship with your brother. I arrived home and without giving it much thought, I sent a text to my brother, inviting he and his wife to Kansas for Thanksgiving. Although they declined, I'm certain they were stunned by the invite after seven years. I wasn't disappointed in my heart because I knew that a door had just been opened. Since that sermon in November, I began seeing, and I'm going to say this. Since Missy took a step of obedience, changing her story just a little bit. She began seeing and experiencing God's power at work. On Christmas, my twin sister told me that she was so surprised by my Thanksgiving invitation to my brother, she decided to send a Christmas gift to my brother and sister, whom she had not spoken to for nearly seven years. To my surprise, my brother and wife sent me a fruit basket. My sister wanted to know if that was the fruit I was talking about when I told her you will know them by their fruit. And I said, well, not exactly, but sort of. Things were happening and I was paying attention as the walls began to come down. I saw it happening and I knew God was softening the hearts of our family. Two months later on January 6th, I had just left church when my twin called. She told me that my brother's wife had just died in a Miami hospital. Carol was only 62 years old. She collapsed in the airport And my brother resuscitated her, but she stopped breathing again in the ambulance and passed away in the early morning hours. All I could think of was the horror my brother must have experienced watching his wife die in a Miami airport after just returning from a delightful cruise. I was grateful that God had spent the last two months preparing our hearts. In just two months, our hearts were open and willing to give my brother 
and his three sons the support they so desperately needed. My daughter texted me from Colorado and said, I'm curious if this loss, as tragic as it might be, will be a great awakening for our extended family as a whole. I tried to explain about the sermon that was preached. I tried to to explain that, I'm sorry, I preached a sermon on family and I've been trying to mend my relationship with my brother. Now I can see God's perfect timing. I was so grateful that our hearts were prepared for this crisis. We stood in line at the visitation, walking, waiting to talk to my brother Mike and his three boys. My twin and I commented that we could feel the love. It was absolutely tangible. All the siblings were greeted with hugs and sincere words of gratitude were exchanged by my brother and his boys. I tried to explain that God was in the midst of this, and we truly ached for his loss. Mike's response was simple, but it said everything. Oh, miss, I love you. After the funeral service, we gathered at Mike's house for a celebration of life. Again, the love was absolutely tangible throughout the night. Nothing but kind words and loving thoughts were expressed that evening among family members. I knew that I was witnessing God at work in the healing of my broken family. It was everything good. It was everything that I had hoped for. When I returned home, I tried to explain this experience to others, but I couldn't find the right words. All I could think of was that it felt like a revival had taken place. That is, the coming together of a group of people with our own baggage. Something happened, and when we left, we were different people. We were at peace. That's God, and that's awesome. Every time I share this story, I start with God, and I talk about a sermon, I share God's word, and the reminder that family really does matter, and my genuine desire to do what was right, I picked up the phone, and the healing began. We have to do our part so that God can work through us, and that may be as simple as picking up a phone and making a phone call. You really never know how God might use something so simple to impact a family. I never could have imagined that my broken family could be healed in such an amazing way. I'm forever grateful. See, we're not called to be bystanders. That's not... That's not good enough. It's not good enough just to be bystanders, to, to just sit and experience God's kingdom and go, this is great. Boy, God is good. God is doing some amazing things. And I'm just, I'm just going to enjoy it. Because isn't that, isn't that why God does what he does? Because he loves me and, and cares about me and just wants me to just enjoy it. Eh, that's, that's part of it. But just like with his disciples, God is looking for catalysts. God is looking for obedient followers of his who say, you know, it's it's not it's not quite good enough just to avoid my enemies. It's not quite good enough just to be okay with staying away from them and and trying to keep the peace by avoidance because that's not really peace. That's just avoidance. See, peace requires activity on the part of God's children. Peace doesn't happen, as Max Ducato said, it doesn't happen because the guilty are punished. Peace comes about because the innocent are merciful. Because the innocent take action and say, this isn't okay. 
I don't care how they're going to act. This is how Jesus calls me to actively respond. And just like those microorganisms in that yeast works its way through the entire dough, one simple little bitty act like making a phone call, like stepping out in discomfort, stepping out in innocence, when it'd be easy to say, no, it's their fault. They need to come to me. They're the one that needs to ask. We might need to take a step. 